All right, here are the various types of input fields we have. We've got buttons, checkbox, color pickers, date pickers, email, file, hidden ones that I mentioned we'd come back to later, and month, number. You know, I, I don't have to read through all of these, but a number of these didn't exist before HTML5 came out. And when HTML5 came out, it said, you know what? So many people are doing telephone number fields or doing email fields or doing search fields that we're going to go ahead and standardize that these fields exist and ask that browsers or other things that are processing JavaScript will do a little extra work for people and bake that into the browser. So for example, if we wanted to pick a color picker, we would have had to use some JavaScript to make this in the past. However, now it's baked in and most of the modern browsers are going to support all of these different input field types. So there's a link in the video notes to go to look at all of these types. You could look at them in a more depth and see some explanations of them, but here they are for you in a nice list. So we can see that this is an input field of type input. Type input is basically going to be your normal one line input field as opposed to what you might see as a text area we'll look at later. Now we saw the ID here. Again, the purpose of the ID in an input field is to tie it to the label so that these two are synced. However, you absolutely need to have the name and it's common sometimes the name might match the ID. So you'd wonder why do we have both of these? The reason is, is that the name attribute is going to be used on the server side or we could use it with our JavaScript to label or identify what that field is. So we'll get all the data spit out, but we also get to know what the name of the field was and we see it here. It's, it's quite common to name these in camel case. However, you'll see on occasion that you could name these with hyphens as well, but camel case tends to be a little bit more common. Next we have value. So value is going to be the attribute that we'll use in the DOM to get the actual value of the field. So if I start filling this out and I say Zach Gordon, when I submit the form, it's going to give me the name on the back end and it's going to give me the value and later we'll learn how to modify this using JavaScript as well. But it's also possible to hard code a value in to start with. So what you'll see with a lot of forms, so I'm refreshing the page here and notice how this is already filled out for me. What you'll see a lot of times with PHP is let's say that you're going to pay for something and you've already logged in. What you'll see when you go to the checkout page is that it's already got your billing information, it's already got your contact information already set up because on the back end it's using some PHP to pre-populate this value field. So this is important to know that you could pre-populate the value field as well as get that value both with JavaScript and on the server side once that form is submitted. If I clear that out then we can come down to placeholder. Placeholder was something else that was added with HTML5. We used to have to do quite a bit of JavaScript to add this in. But basically if the field is empty then you can add some text as a little bit of a hint. Now what some people do to simplify fields is they'll actually put in the same value for the placeholder as they do for their label, then they might use an accessible way of moving the label off the page so that the average user doesn't see it, but if somebody needs it for accessibility purposes, it's still there. However, it's important to know that you cannot just remove the label because you have it for a placeholder. Just because you're seeing it on the page doesn't really mean that you've properly um, identified what this field really is and the label is still the way to do that. So for accessibility reasons, I'm going to encourage that you have both a label and for usability, you also have a placeholder if that's relevant as well. The placeholder is great though and very helpful to people. You fill in some data, you take it out and it's still there as well. So let's talk next about tab index. It's possible when you use a form to tab through the different elements. However, you could see as I'm tabbing through, I'll start this over again. Notice it starts up top here and then we start tabbing. It goes one, two, three, four, and then it jumps all the way down to subscribe for the newsletter and then the submit. The reason for this is that I have hard coded the tab index in for a number of these fields. So what this does is all forms you could tab through if you're a power user or for accessibility reasons you're using your keyboard to navigate then these can be very helpful. 
However, if you don't have these put in, most browsers will automatically just tab from one field to the other, one, two, three, four, all the way down your field. So you don't necessarily need them, but it can be something helpful to hard code and add in if you feel it's important. But the tab index is there as well. And I'll just pause here and say the reason I'm going through all of these attributes is we saw in the past that we can modify attributes using JavaScript. So one of the most common places people get into using JavaScript is with handling forms. For this reason, if you're going to work with forms in JavaScript, you want to know all of the possible attributes and things like this that you may come across. The next is the access key. And this is a great one that is not commonly used. And it's why I have this abbreviation thing up here. Notice that I put a little abbreviation and I styled it to be underlined like this under the end. What this is doing is telling people that if they use the keyboard shortcut in the browser, in Chrome it's going to be Control, Option, or Alt, N, they could jump straight to that field. Notice that I have one here for S for the subject. So I could hit the keyboard shortcut for S or for M, and I will jump into those fields. This is more power user keyboard navigation type thing, but the access key is a great way to allow users to be able to use keyboard shortcuts to jump around. And this attribute access key is not just for form elements, it's what's called a global attribute, meaning you could stick it on links or other things on your page. And if you are building an app or something like that where keyboard shortcuts are helpful, then this is gonna be something you might wanna really consider putting in as well as for usability reasons in UX, you wanna style it some way or have some sort of notification or walkthrough that notifies people, hey, you could use keyboard shortcuts to navigate through the site. Now I will say that access keys are not the same across all browsers and you do potentially have to worry about conflicts with competing with other shortcuts that people have set either on their computer or in the browser or within a larger app that you might be coding in. So you may have some conflicts there that you have to test against and it's a good idea to look through the link in the video notes so that you can get an idea of how these operate differently or are called differently depending on what browser you're in. But that's the access key, um, a very helpful accessibility usability thing here for forms. So that brings us next to the auto focus field and notice that it's set to true here. And all that does is if I come to my page and I'm just gonna hard refresh it, watch where my cursor goes, straight to this field. Again, I could put it down in this field, refresh the page and it goes right there. If I were to remove this and refresh my page, Notice that it does not go there. Again, I put it back in, refresh my page, and boom, you're right there. Now, this has some pros and cons to it. On the one hand, if you know that you're trying to get someone into a form right away, then this could be helpful. It could be a little annoying though sometimes. Let's say that we wanted to autofocus on this email here. So instead, I brought this all the way down on the page to my email field. And I just tacked on autofocus here, come up to the top of my page, and it dropped me down. Let's, let's put it somewhere even further. Let's just take our whole email field and move it way, way down to the very bottom. I just want to demonstrate something here. Okay, so now it's, it's showing what I want to, which is, let's say we're starting up at the top of the page here and we navigate to a page, but it auto focuses us to something that's way at the bottom of the page. We don't really know that we missed all of this stuff here, or you might be on a page where let's say it was responsive and you were auto navigating them to something that was in the sidebar, but then when it got small, you're sticking them all the way down to the bottom because of how things are floating around on the page. That could be really annoying to the user. So make sure if you are using autofocus that you use it intelligently and you really think about let's see where did our email field go right there you really think about the user and the different experiences that they may have with this that said the autofocus is not just helpful for hard coding 
because we could change all attributes using JavaScript, we can also use JavaScript to autofocus someone in the field. So if someone takes a behavior, like clicks on a button and we want to drop them right down to a form, we could do that using JavaScript. And we'll look at later how to do that.